Um, welcome to the 940th monthly meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. Uh, tonight, our guest speaker is Rachel Frieden. She's going to talk, her talk is titled Astronomy from Passion to Profession. But as you all know, we have many other things to talk about first. So not, without uh, any hesitation, here's our agenda for the night. Um, I've added outreach just because there is one thing to talk about. Um, but let's see if we can move through these items. All right, Glenn Chapel, I'm going to make you read this because I didn't even understand it. Hey, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. All right. Uh, clickbait, that's the type of stuff you get while it's on when you're on the website and they have all these little teasers to get you to go to a certain website. It's also the way the news operates. So for clickbait, for instance, this giant molecular cloud collapsed under its own gravity. You won't believe what it looks like now. Ten signs you are going supernova. Number three will shock you. Fuse hydrogen into helium with what, this one simple trick. This red giant emitted a glowing shell of ionized gas. What happened next will blow your mind. It sounds just like the news broadcast. So there's always those teasers. Okay, we'll go to the next one. And by the way, before I go any further, I've got it right here. You guys are seeing I'm gonna lose this thing. I'm not gonna let go of it. Where the hell did it go? <laughs> Save that extra copy for me, just in case. It okay, probably fell, it, Glenn, it probably huh? fell right where last year is. is. <laughs> Holy, there it is. I've got, in fact, uh, wait a second. No, I've done it. I've distracted Glenn. <laughs> Here's the 2020. Here's the 2016. They're all over the place. Yeah, it's like a nest. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you, Eileen, for offering to save me a copy because I probably will need it. Galileo, another famous uh, Italian astronomer after our own Mario. The sun with all those planets revolving around it and dependent upon it can still ripen a bunch of grapes as if it had nothing else in the universe to do. So it's kind of interesting to think of the, the simple things we take uh, our star for granted. Uh, next slide. And did we get this all? Yeah, we did. Okay. I, I, you, you must have worked on that, Rich, because my computer sent a huge font. Thank you for getting it straight. A uh, bunch of things going on. A lot of them involve the planet's naked eye viewing. Uh, Friday and Saturday, April 16th and 17th, this will be in the evening, Mars is going to be close to a waxing crescent moon. The moon will be a little bit below Mars on, the, on Friday night and above it on Saturday night. We have a meteor shower coming up. This is not a, a major one, the Lyrid meteor shower, but they've had an outburst in the past. Uh, the waning gibbous moon is going to be in the way. Uh, the Lyrids are best seen in the early morning hours of the 22nd. And you might expect about anywhere from a half dozen to 10 meteors or so. On Monday, April 26th, Mars is going to be a half a degree from M35. That might be a neat little binocular sight. And of course, also you catch them together in a, in a telescope, although Mars won't be very impressive. It's less than five arc seconds across right now in size. On May 3rd in the morning sky, Saturn pairs up with a waning crescent moon. And 45 minutes after sunset that evening, Mercury will be two degrees from the Pleiades, but you're going to have to look low in the west-northwest. Mercury will make a nice favorable appearance, uh, appearance uh, in May itself. So it might be worth looking at this for binoculars, but you'll definitely need a very low horizon to the west-northwest. Uh, On Tuesday and Wednesday, those two mornings, Jupiter will pair up with the waning crescent moon. On Thursday, May 6th, another uh, meteor shower in the early morning, the Ada Aquarium meteor shower. And this one's kind of tough because the, uh, the radiance is very low in the sky. So most of those meteors will go below and they'll be below the horizon for us. But again, if you're a meteor fan, you can't sleep on uh, May 6th in the morning, go outside and, and give it, a, I, I've looked sometimes for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes and I've seen nothing, I'll go back inside. And that's when the quote unquote manure hits the fan and there are thousands of meteors and I'm in bed asleep and you guys are all talking about it the next day. But it's worth getting up to give it a look, see if you happen to get up. On uh, Wednesday, May 12th and the following day on May 13th, Venus and Mercury are gonna be pairing up with the moon. The interesting one will be May 12th and this will definitely be a challenge. You definitely need a really, really low horizon and you better look about 30 minutes after sunset. It'll still be kind of bright there, but Venus is going to pair up with a one day old crescent moon. This thing is going to be 1% illuminated, which you've seen, you're going to see a little hairline, just a little hairline crescent. So it'd be very interesting if you can, if you can catch that. The next night, a little bit easier, Mercury will pair up with a two day old crescent moon. And again, you have to look low in the West. So a lot of things going on, especially with the planets this particular 
them within a couple of meteor showers. You know, Glenn, yeah. the, pair, the pairing of Venus with the one-day-old crescent, Venus will still be at around minus fourth magnitude. So with a pair of binoculars, that's what I would look for first. Yeah. And then try to find the moon net after that. Um, and a good star atlas, a good digital star atlas will show you exactly what you're supposed to look at. So yeah. awesome. Let's go it to the tough though. I remember getting, the first time I ever saw Mercury was with a two day old moon. Even that two day old moon, it was just a little hairline. I couldn't believe how skinny it was. I don't think I've ever seen a one day old moon. So that might be a challenge and if anybody in the club as well. Awesome. All right, on to the next, we're gonna do the uh, observer's challenge for this month. Make sure this clicks, there we go. There we go. And these are the finder charts. It's an easy one to find. It's the interacting galaxy pair, NGC 3226 and 3227. Uh, 3227 is the brighter of the two. It's a, uh, it's a safer galaxy, which is basically a, uh, um, a spiral galaxy with a, a, a quasar-like nucleus. And the main chart that you see, the whole constellation of, uh, of Leo, and it's right near the star Algeba. Gamma, which yeah. is a beautiful double star. And I did, and I know when I wrote this up, I said, give Algeba a look-see first. I think they're about four to five arc seconds apart. I forget the magnitudes, but they're both like a K and M type pair. So they're beautiful golden, uh, golden yellow colors. But all you have to do, we'll go to the, the picture over there on the other side. That 2.6 is the magnitude, combined magnitude of Algeba. And NGC 3226 slash 3227 are less than a degree to the east. You actually go right between a pair of ninth magnitude stars that show as 9.0 and 8.9. They'll get you to the sweet spot right in the same field of view. Next slide. I made a sketch and this was with the, a 10 inch telescope. And to me, what I saw was two fuzzy blobs. The bigger, brighter blob was, of course, NGC 3227. And uh, to me, with this 10-inch scope, it reminded me a lot of a small scope view of M57 and its companion NGC 5195. In a small scope, they look as a couple of uh, uh, fuzzy blobs. And I thought saw the same thing with these two galaxies. I did try a little four-inch scope just for the heck of it. And I was able to see NGC 3227 barely. It was averted vision. I knew exactly where to look, but I was working with magnitude five skies. I bet if you were at a place like Stellafane, uh, you wouldn't have too much trouble seeing uh, the brighter one and possibly both galaxies with a small scope. And Glenn, finally, Glenn, I was looking at these two objects last night um, with a 10 inch scope. And you're right, they're a bit of they, this, this is an observer's challenge for a reason. Um, they're relatively faint. Um, uh, as I wrote in last month's observer's challenge report, Michael Covington is, has what is quoted as saying that every each galaxy deserves at least 15 minutes of your attention. And mm -hmm. this one is a perfect example for that. When I first looked at the field, there was nothing there. And mm -hmm. the more I looked at it, all of a sudden you could see that ghostly, oh, there it is, I see yeah. it now. And after 15, 20, 30 minutes, um, they were, they were uh, fairly apparent. Um, I was using eyepieces that gave me exit pupils of around one to two millimeters. <laughs> uh, to try to darken up the sky. And I could actually see a 14th magnitude star that's right sort of in front of um, 3227, um, which is the brighter of the two galaxies. Um, but uh, so I, yeah, they're, they're faint, but they're worth, they're worth going out and looking at, I think. Yeah, and by the way, just before we go to the next slide, this is uh, the orientation here. Uh, somebody asked why I have uh, making a note to note the direction of west. That's because the easiest way for me to find directions is just to let the field drift. And once I've established West, I just, I also redid this sketch. So West would be over the side and North would be up in this particular field, but that's how I find North. I just let the field of view drift to the West and then I can establish the other directions from there. But this is the same orientation. The next picture is one that Mario took a little bit different than what I saw with a 10 inch scope. This is with this 32 inch scope. And, um, those were the challenges. By the way, I hate to spill the beans, or but I want to let you know you've been struggling with these observers' challenges for the past few months. They've all been 11th magnitude galaxies. Our observance challenge for May is going to be a Messier 3, the globular cluster. And my own personal challenge is going to be just to see what's the smallest scope I can still resolve the stars in that. It shouldn't be I don't think you'll need too large a telescope to resolve that. I'm going to try that little four and a half inch scope and see how that goes. Uh, but that's it uh, for this particular month. Yeah. Keep looking up. I was I was looking at this image earlier this afternoon, and I um, I marvel at how deep um, Mario's telescope actually goes. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you you guys have heard me um, refer, reference Sky Safari Pro, 
um, which I like. This in Sky Safari Pro, this star right here is listed as magnitude 16.6. And it makes me wonder about these stars yeah. right in here. Those stars are well below 20th magnitude, I think. And if you look really carefully on a detailed star at list, like this little fuzzy blob right here is a distant galaxy in the background. And so is the little fuzzy blob right next to that star. And if you look, you know, if you look closely in this image, you can see other galaxies that are way, way beyond these guys. These guys are out around 65 to 67 million light years, which is why they're actually so faint. You know, it's a few hundred billion stars, but well, you put some distance between you and them and they, they get pretty faint. But it was a fun thing that it's easy to find. Um, and it's, a, it's sort of a fun object to look at. If you can get to a dark sky, I think no sweat in a four or five inch telescope. Um, pretty good, pretty good. Is that it, Glenn? I think that might be it, right? That's it, thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, your observer's report. Fabulous. Um, just as an update, um, again, uh, asteroid Vesta is moving through Leo the Lion. It's getting fainter with each passing night, but if you're interested in seeing it, um, Sky and Telescope, uh, you can go click on their website and they gave this nice finder chart um, so you'll know where to look. And just as a reminder, June 10th, the morning of, um, when sunrise occurs here in New England, uh, there will be a very uh, deep partial eclipse of it. Uh, this is an annular eclipse that is visible from parts of Southern Canada, uh, across Northern Greenland, and I think into Siberia. Um, yeah, I suppose you could go there. Sky and Telescope is putting together a tour uh, by, via jet. Um, if you want to drop some serious cash, um, you can go see the annual, annual eclipse. I'm going to probably find a nice place by the ocean and hope for clear weather. Um, so that's the morning of June 10th. Tonight's speaker, Rachel, it's your turn. Um, tonight's speaker is Rachel Freed. Now I'm going to stop for a second. I have to find you, Rachel, so I can make you a co-host. There you are. I have to find you. Make co-host. Yes, so that should, that should allow you to share your screen. Now I'm gonna shrink this down because half of my screen is gone. Let's see, how do I do this? I move it up there. So Rachel is a co-founder and the president of the uh, Institute for Student Astronomical Research with the goal of incorporating scientific research into high school and undergraduate education. Rachel holds a BS degree in biology from UC Davis and an MS in neuroscience from Northwestern University. She taught high school chemistry. Um, and astronomy for 10 years and has conducted research on chemistry education. Rachel is currently working on a PhD in astronomy education and is also a faculty lecturer in the School of Education at Sonoma State University. She has over 20 published papers, published papers mostly with student co-authors. Rachel has been an amateur astronomer for over 20 years and is involved in public outreach. She's been a volunteer docent at the Robert Ferguson Observatory in Sonoma County for 12 years. She is also the editor of the Journal of Double Star Observations. There you go, Glenn, and is on the board of the Advanced Imaging Conference. Now I can't see the rest of it, so I'm gonna have to move my bar. Rachel's work uh, focuses on promoting cha changes in education that build on students' intrinsic motivations and interests. And so I am going to stop sharing my screen and Rachel, I'm gonna let you share your screen and everybody's muted, but let's everybody give um, Rachel a nice round of applause. Thank you for being here tonight with us. I'm gonna mute myself, um, I think. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. So thank you for having me. It's so Great. cool to see um, a whole club doing all the club things on the other side of the country from where I am. I'm coming to you from where Galileo, he hinted at the sun, uh, uh, you know, making the grapes grow. I'm here in, in Sonoma, Sonoma, California, where we certainly have those grapes growing. Um, so let me share my screen. Let me pull up my presentation thing, which is right there, present, share screen. And uh, I am really excited to talk to all of you. Um, although I feel like, oh, let me move all your faces off of there onto that screen. Um, I feel like Rich sort of ran through my whole presentation by running over my bio, but um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I just want to share with you all my story because it's kind of um, kind of exciting and not a straight and narrow path, but I am living a dream 
that I never could have imagined doing astronomy and outreach and education and learning myself and using telescopes around the world. It, and it's something that I never, you know, as a child, I, I said, I want to be an astronomer and I want to get a degree in astrophysics, which I didn't do. But, you know, I don't know what exactly I thought that meant, but I didn't follow that path per se, but now I am living this amazing dream. And so I want to go through that and then also tell you about the research projects that the students that I work with get to do. So, um, all right. So really, my these are some pictures that I took. I just take my telescope out to the bike path near me and hold my iPhone up and everyone who bikes by, I say, hey, you want to come look at Jupiter? And, and they screech and turn around and come look at Jupiter or whatever. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I, so that's some of the outreach I've been doing before COVID. Um, but uh, anyway, so let me just move on. So of course, um, oh, one of my favorite things to photograph, and if you follow me on Facebook, almost every month you, you'll see a live, a Facebook live of the moon rising above the hills. And um, that's one of my favorite things to do. But um, here's kids, and I just, you all, I know you've you've spent many hours of your life thinking about you know, astronomy and there's something that captures your imagination. And I just want you to sort of think about that for a second here. What is it about astronomy? And I know for myself, I, I can't even really quite describe what it is. It's just, it's my imagination has always been captured. There's always been this draw. I get excited thinking and learning and teaching about astronomy. I don't even know why. All right, um, and then these kids that I get to show things to, they, this little girl on the bottom left, she spent 30 minutes just playing with that telescope. She was four years old. It's amazing. Um, so um, I will say I took a, a hiatus away from um, astronomy after really being interested in astronomy as a kid. I ended up studying biology and neuroscience. So that's not a telescope there. I'm I'm playing with that's an electron microscope and and there's some cells inside the brain of a little hamster that I used to study. Um, but then what's interesting, um, this was me in graduate school, I have got a master's in neuroscience, I was doing light curves, but not of space things these were um, neurons in the lamprey spinal cord, <laughs> but light curves nonetheless, because we were using calcium sensitive dyes that would fluoresce when calcium entered the cells. So um, I've been doing um, studying light for a long time. <laughs> um, but I will say my real journey into astronomy started in about 2000, so 21 years ago, when I joined the local astronomy club. And one thing I, I know you all can relate to this, but one thing that strikes me is these people, I have been part of my my world my life my family for 20 years now I still see these same people and interact with them and I just think astronomy is an amazing community an amazing way to to build community and maintain community um, even through a global pandemic actually um, and there's a couple people that I'm going to point out along the way in this story because they they re-emerge in cool ways 20 years later. So for example, um, Daryl Stanford here is a professor at the local community college in San Mateo, a couple hours from me. And I met him and took a picture with film actually um, of him in 2000. And then in 2018, I invited him to be a speaker at a conference that I put on in Hawaii. Um, and so it's there's just been these really cool connections that have been maintained over the decades. Um, but it's it was with this astronomy club that I really got to know the sky and do things like go observe and share with the public Mercury transiting across the sun. That was that was a fun time. Um, so I joined this club and then I joined other clubs, but I was a, a high school science teacher. Um, and many of you might have been t science teachers of some kind. And no matter how many explosions, how many things you can make change color, no matter how many fire breathing pumpkins you do um, for your classes, you know, getting students to actually learn and engage with the material and really understand science is always the, the hard part of teaching. And so I always have these questions of how do I get my students to connect with the material in a, a deep and meaningful way for real serious change in learning. Um, so teaching chemistry, of course, was super fun because you get to blow things up and have fire. And But of course, astronomy was also great because you could get the telescopes out. <laughs> um, but then I joined the local club. So I'm in Sonoma. And this has been, and 
the theme of, of everything I do in my life and all of my astronomy world is this building of community and this community of practice and just getting myself, getting students engaged with the greater community. And of course, I see all 56 of you here on a Thursday night, you know, being part of your community. And I, I love that. And I noticed there were a couple of young, younger people in the meeting too, and that's great. Um, but um, so I joined the Ferguson Observatory um, and we, we have our building and we have our struggles with, I don't think we've ever have a, had a window pane fall out, but you know, we have to take care of the, the place. Um, here I am with the, the widow of Robert Ferguson, who the observatory is named after. And at, you know, 80 something years of age, she's still pulling weeds and we're all volunteering to keep this place we love going and available to the public. And um, I just, it's, Astronomers are amazing. Amateur astronomers, the community, you guys are amazing. Um, but for me, I started going to this observatory in particular when my kids were like six months old and two. And so here they are under the telescope being kids. Luckily, you know, everyone there encouraged me to, you know, bring the kids and we'll take them for a walk while you can take a minute to look through a telescope. Or here, we'll show your two-year-old daughter something through the telescope. Or yeah, your son's really obsessed with vacuums. Sure, he can evac vacuum the observatory. And you know what? There was some interesting science we all got to experience during that. We used to do, um, actually, well, before COVID, we would month, at our monthly star parties, we'd have a daytime solar observing and then we'd set up a radio telescope with just some wires. And my son, of course, was vacuuming the room and we were getting, well, oh, I sort of gave away the, the story, but we're getting these really weird radio signals from the sun and we're like, what's going on with the sun today? And then we realized it was every time you turn the vacuum on or off, we got a great signal from the vacuum. Um, anyway, uh, so this being part of a club is, can be transformative in, in so many ways, as you guys all know. Um, so there's the kids a while ago. Um, and of course, the star parties, we get to go to Yosemite. I don't know where the coolest place you guys get to do star parties is, but for us, it's Yosemite. Um, so overlooking Half Dome and showing people, you know, the amazing sky and whatnot is just an, an incredible experience. And of course, taking pictures with these research grade telescopes. These were the first three pictures I ever got to take. It was a dream come true. It was one of those things you, you know, you imagine you see pictures in Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine, but then to sit down at the computer and have someone help walk you through, you know, point it here and click, you know, take image, and then you wait for 30 seconds and there's M51. Oh my gosh, that was the first picture I took and I literally jumped out of my seat and I still do when I, when the picture comes up on the screen. Um, but these were dreams come true. And so remember, and you guys, I'm sure you all see this when you're doing your outreach, that you're making dreams come true for people. <laughs> um, so that was an amazing experience for me. Um, and then the, here the, the kids are now, this is like 12 years later and my daughter, this was actually a couple years ago still, but she's now helping run the telescopes. My son, not so interested in telescopes, but he finds little scorpions around the observatory and, and shows them to all the astronomers and everyone gets excited about that. So, um, so it's really cool to have them being part of my life. Um, and now, as I was teaching chemistry and astronomy, I would relate, I, I volunteered at the NASA Mars Center, and I would relate what was going on with Spirit and Opportunity Rovers in 2004 to the spectroscopy we were doing on chemical elements in the classroom and tried to like really make the science that they were learning in the classroom relatable to things outside of that little world. But still, there needed to be a deeper connection. So then I got involved with the Society for Astronomical Sciences has, I know it's always on the West Coast. Has anyone been to this conference that is held every year in Southern California? Okay, I see a, a head shaking. Yes, but, um, indeed. I heard you speak there. Oh, right. Hi, James. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I met that guy. Did you guys recognize that guy in the middle? Russ Janae. He wrote the books on robotic control of telescopes in the... 90s, late 80s and early 90s with Mark Trueblood. Um, and I met him at this conference and I had, I just heard someone mention Russ Janet, he's a force of nature. And I was like, I want to meet a force of nature. And so then when I heard someone say, oh, look, there's Russ Janet at the bar. I was like, where, where? So I went up and said, hi, I'm Rachel. Um, and we started working together. <laughs> and this is where the story gets really exciting. So um, a little side note, um, at that conference, this was 2014, I think, that was actually the first time I had ever heard of um, supernova light echoes um, in a talk by Doug Welch, 
whom uh, five years later, four years later, I invited to be a guest speaker at another conference, um, actually the conference in Hawaii that I put on. So it's cool how these, you know, you get to know these people and, and then build these greater communities and it's exciting. Anyway, so Russ had been teaching an astronomy research seminar to, at a community college and to some high school and community college students where they would do double star astrometry. They would actually do research, collect their own data, analyze their data, and very uniquely write up their results for publication. And here I was looking for some authentic science for my students. And I was like, I want my students to do this. Teach me how, because I've never done double star astrometry. Um, so we started um, doing that. This was my very first paper with students and it was a really big learning process, a big learning curve. If you've never, I had taken those pretty pictures of some galaxies, but if you had have never done astronomy research and remember I'm a biologist and a neuroscience, neuroscientist by training, but you know, you get your images and then what do you do? So we did get a paper out of it. Don't look up the paper, it's not great. I have better ones now, but um, we spent a year with, you know, helping me get my students to do research. And then we spent a year saying, all right, how can we fix, uh, make this easier? And how can we help other people around the country and around the world do double star research? So just really briefly, what we're actually doing, of course, so double stars go around, not this fast, not the ones we orbit. They orbit, of course, on the or order of, thousands to tens of thousands of years. But if we take a picture, say say John Herschel took a picture a hundred and something years ago and we take another picture now, we might catch them in two different places. Um, and we can measure their position angles. And I'm going quickly through this because I know you are all astronomers. Um, but, and we measure their separation in arc seconds. And um, when Glenn was talking, he twice mentioned this his five arc second um, something that was five arc seconds apart. And that caught my attention because our limit right now with the telescopes we're using is five arc seconds apart. But I'll mention that we're getting into speckle interferometry. So we can get really close doubles. In any case, we measure position angles and separations and can hopefully add data points to orbits that may have been calculated. Although honestly, I've been doing this now for six years and we're running out of double stars that are in the five arc second or greater apart range for which orbits have already been calculated. So we're getting to the point where we can't add point data points, which is really interesting, but we have other things we can do. So this is an orbit that's um, been observed over probably a hundred and something years, first with um, photographic or, or uh, actually just visual observations in green and then photographic observations. And in there, there's a, a Parkos uh, satellite uh, measurement and some some other satellite image measurement. In any case, this is just the basics of what we do. We measure these double stars. And um, so Russ and I started collecting people to have meetings. Um, I heard reference to ACP, getting your guys' observatory up and running. Here's Bob Denny who wrote ACP. I also saw in one of your slides, uh, your, the, the middle mid observatory using a CDK 17, the plane wave. Here's Dave Rowe who designed that. <laughs> so we started getting together people that know some stuff and said, how do we build this institute? How do we get astronomy research opportunities to students and educators on a bigger scale? And we had meetings. Um, oh, you might know Stella Kafka. You might know Tom Field if you ever do spectroscopy. Um, so we just started having meetings and then a year after our first meeting at the SAS conference, we were like, yay, we're making progress. Let's have a beer. And then we had more meetings <laughs> and more meetings. <laughs> you guys know how this goes, right? You have to have lots of meetings to figure out how to run a program. But eventually we started the Institute for Student Astronomical Research and we got a three year National Science Foundation grant to develop materials, to build a course, to go out and promote this, to teach students how to do this really basic research, just an introduction to science. But oh my gosh, an introduction to science, to real science can be transformative. And I've seen this now for dozens of students. 
But, um, and it's not just an introduction to science, it's also an introduction to writing science, communicating science, being engaged in the larger community around science. Um, so boy, this is so fun. This class actually is ongoing right now and we have seven papers that are gonna be published probably in July um, from, and I can tell you more about that, it's super exciting. These are high school students, college students, high school teachers, community college instructors, university professors all working together to do this research. Um, so we have this institute. Who knew you could just make an institute out of thin air? I now know you can. <laughs> um, we created, uh, wrote this book, Small Telescope Astronomical Research. So I got to help be an editor on a book. We have an entire Canvas course. So when I teach this course, I teach this astronomy research seminar to these students and these teachers, I can say, hey, teachers, Here's a copy of this whole course with all our material ready to go for you to change it and make it yours and, you know, make it fit your audience. Um, and it's pretty cool. So there's this ready made course for this really simple double star astronomy, astrometry. That's an excellent introduction to science. Um, and so literally in eight to 10 weeks, we go from like our little Zoom meetings of what is double star astrometry? First, what are double stars and what is astrometry? To having papers that eventually get published in the Journal of Double Star Observations. And this was the November 1st issue and all the ones with the yellow stars are from different student teams. They're not all my student teams, but this, or, this, um, this sort of program has spread around the country and actually the world. Um, I found out there's a, a class in Chile where the teacher took my course in the fall and he's now teaching it to his students in Chile. Amazing. And I know um, some teams in Australia where they took my class in the fall and now there's kids in Australia doing this astrometry research. Um, so anyway, a little bit more about my story. Um, I quit teaching because I wanted to focus on this astronomy stuff, this institute stuff sort of full time, but I quit teaching and I was like, oh, I have no job and no income and two kids to support. Um, I hope this works out. And, um, but I will say I'm a big fan of social media. I post all my astronomy outreach on Facebook and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific contacted me and say, hey, we see you're not working. You wanna come work for us? And I was like, oh my God, another dream come true. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I got to work with them and they actually had me moderate um, courses where people were learning how to use the Skynet robotic telescope network. Um, if you're familiar with Skynet, there are um, a bunch of telescopes in the northern and southern all over the world um, connected through an online portal. They're all different types of telescopes owned by different institutions. Um, but uh, you just can go online and access these telescopes. And so I got to use telescopes um, and teach people how to use them. And that was a lot of fun. Um, but the story gets even cooler. So talking about connections and community and um, and reaching out. So of course it was just fun working with the people because they were great, but they flew me out for a meeting in um, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And this is Dan Riker who runs Skynet. He started Skynet and he runs Skynet. He built the prompt telescopes for the gamma ray burst follow-up. Um, and I got to meet him and then um, actually, <laughs> Check this out. I, I just uh, two weeks ago, a week ago, got hired for a postdoctoral position, even though I haven't quite finished the PhD, working for him at North University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, doing research on astronomy education starting in three weeks. Yay. So connections, I think you, um, con connections and the community are amazing. Um, take a step back. Here's the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and um, they emailed and they said, hey, this guy, Michael Fitzgerald, who I had never heard of, is coming from Australia. He's an astronomer and an astronomy education researcher. He's coming to visit the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Anyone want to go out to lunch with him? And I was like, sure, I love lunch. I'll go out. And so a bunch of us took Michael Fitzgerald out for lunch. Um, and then I mentioned him to Russ Janae, who I built the institute with, and he and I said, this guy's doing all the same research we've been doing. And um, so they connected. And they said, you know what, we should have a conference. We should have a conference on robotic telescopes, student research and education. And hence was born the annual until COVID um, robotic telescope conference, for student research and education. Um, and also Michael Fitzgerald is who I'm getting my PhD with. Um, he got a grant and said, Rachel, I have money for a doctoral student. You wanna be that? I was like, sure. Um, so um, anyway, back to the ASP. Another thing I love doing is tinkering with Arduinos. 
And of course I put that on Facebook and they, the ASP got a grant from Intel and Intel said, hey, we want you to find all your amateur astronomers and let them for six months, we'll give you some of our new little boards and they can brainstorm anything they can dream of to, um, that they can make with, um, with these little Arduinos, you know, related to astronomy, let them build it, prototype it, we'll give them some money and give them some stuff. And so the ASP knew I loved tinkering with these things because on Facebook, I'm like, look, I made the little blinky lights blink. Um, and so they hired me to um, run that program. But the upshot is my friends at the local observatory that I'm part of be, joined that program and for six months worked and prototyped. And now our observatory roll off roof and weather system is all controlled by two Arduinos. So they were able to build their own observatory control system with a roll off roof and all that from Arduinos. And so it's just a really, a really neat thing um, to, to be a part of <laughs> and to help make it happen, even though I didn't actually build that one. Um, and the story keeps going and I'm gonna try and move through some parts quickly. I, I then got hired um, at Sonoma State University for the NASA Education and Public Outreach Program, where I got to work with Dr. Lynn Kaminsky and, and take students up to do research on the local telescope. Uh, that was a tough time. That was when we had the begin, the first of our now annual fires that destroy everything. Um, but everything except the telescope dome um, and telescope inside, everything else burned down, including the electrical grid. And that was really devastating. But the telescope dome survived, not because it's fireproof. I learned from the company when I told them this story, they said, that's weird. Our domes are not fireproof. Um, but because it was on a cement platform and the grass was super low around it and the fires went through really hot and fast. Anyway, that's a whole nother side story. Back to the robotic telescope conference. So we had our first one in 2017, RTSRE, Robotic Telescope Student Research and Education Conference. And we invited all the people. You guys will recognize some of these folks. So um, maybe not Todd Borison, who was the um, director of the Las Cumbres Observatory Telescope Network, but Richard Berry. You guys have probably all read his book. Um, let's see, Aaron Lacluse, he actually designed and built some of the original prompt telescopes that are part of Skynet. Um, Russ Janay, one of his books, Telescope Control, you may have read that. Um, and of course, Bob Denny from DC3 Dreams. Um, and then down below, Carl Pennypacker from the Global Hands on Universe and um, Paul Lucas who runs telescopes in Australia and Tom Field from RSpec and uh, the folks from the Micro Observatory. You might know the Micro Observatory folks where you guys are, um, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics um, and Kate Meredith from Yerke. So we just had this amazing group of educators and astronomers all meeting with the goal of saying, how do we bring this meaningful education using robotic telescopes to everyone globally? Um, and it was an amazing conference. And the biggest thing that came out of that conference was the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Sky Partners, where they have now 22 institutions around the world who have for no charge access to their network of um, 0.4 meter telescopes, Northern and Southern Hemisphere, there's 10 of them um, and we get to use them. So I get to use those telescopes with my students just all the time. Um, so that was amazing. Then we had our TSRE 2018 in Hawaii. So it pays to help put together conferences because you get to go to cool places. And again, Daryl Stanford from my first astronomy club ever and Michael Fitzgerald, my PhD thesis and all these crazy people coming together again to say, how do we, how do we improve education? And you know what? Astronomy captures the imagination. This is a good place to, to try and teach science. Um, and now I get to work on my um, PhD in astronomy education. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now, except to say that what I'm really studying is what is the impact of these student research programs on students and teachers? Is it making a difference? Because if it's not, I need to get a new career. Um, anyway, so what I do is I help students. This is, we had a group of students up at um, Mount Wilson Observatory using the 100 inch telescope to do double star astrometry. And that was amazing. But one thing that struck me was one of these students after our visit there and after their research was published, she made a painting of the 100 inch dome. And it just sort of took me back to, to wow, there's also that, 
that visceral connection we have to the night sky and the beauty of the night sky and, and humanity's attempt to understand our place in the universe. So it goes beyond the science to, to just who we are and has a really neat impact on students. So that was a high school student's painting after she visited Mount Wilson Observatory. Um, Neef, I will say you guys, I know you're the amateur telescope makers of Boston. I've never made a telescope, sorry. The only time I ever ground any of the glass was at Neef a couple years ago. I did sit at your booth and, and grind for a minute. It was really fun. Um, but one of the other things I do in addition to bringing these students, these astronomy research seminars, is I try and provide opportunities for them to interact with the, the larger community. And actually there was mention of Arnie Hendon. Here's Arnie Hendon at the bottom right, watching one of my students present her research, which is cool. The other person watching is um, of kind of exciting note here is Don Pettit, an astronaut who has been into the International Space Station several times. And, and so the students got to have an astronaut. These are high school students presenting their research for the first time ever in a public place. And there's a NASA astronaut like asking them questions. Um, it was amazing. Um, and of course, for me, because I was running these workshops, my name was in the little NIAC NIF ad. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in Sky and Telescope Magazine, which was another like, amazing milestone. Um, <laughs> one of those things you don't dream about, but then it happens and you're like, what? Um, and then I got to go and, and, and give a talk at the Republic of Kosovo. If any of you, you've probably, most of you been to Neef and maybe you know Pranvera Hayasani from Kosovo and her astronomy outreach. Anyway, um, I got to go with her and meet all these people and talk about astronomy education. So it's just been an amazing adventure. Robert Reeves, um, he asked them to name an asteroid after me and they did, which was exciting. So there's just, it's just been this incredible um, whirlwind adventure for 20 years, um, which is my life. Uh, the Advanced Imaging Conference, which is held in San Jose, California every two years. Last time they, out in 2019, they asked me to join their board. So I'm on their board. So I get to help figure out how do we expand? How do we stay relevant? Just like, like all the magazines and everything have to continue to do. Um, I get to be on the radio talking about astronomy every month. It's just, you know, I, many of you are probably similar where you just love this stuff and you want to share it with people. And so I get these opportunities. The Astro Imaging Channel had me on there a couple of times, but um, the second time I was on there, I, I said, I want my students to present. They're doing this amazing speckle interferometry work and doing um, double star astrometry with their own little telescopes in their backyard and publishing their research. I want them to come talk about it. And so that was an amazing experience for the students. Um, I got to, invited to talk at the International Astronomical Union's first ever education committee conference. So I got to go to Germany about two months before the world shut down. And that was amazing. Just getting to see what's going on in the Thai astronomical society, what's going on in the Russian schools and connecting with these people and just seeing that this is an international, this is the whole world, something that we can all be passionate about and share. Um, and then we held our third robotic telescope student research and education conference in Melbourne, Australia. So I got to see kangaroos um, and crazy birds. And one of my students remoted in from Florida and gave a talk. So again, I'm trying to integrate the students that do research into the larger community. Um, this past summer, I was asked to take over editorship of the journal of Double Star Observations, where I, my students and I have been publishing for um, many, several years now. And so now I get to do that. Um, luckily, I don't have to be the one that does all the red marking on the papers. You know, I send them out for review. <laughs> but um, so that's been an exciting learning experience. Um, and then I was also asked to join the Sky and Telescope Editorial Advisory Committee to talk, you know, to help figure out, you know, how do we how do we ma maintain our relevance? How do we stay involved? How do we stay meaningful? How do we build our readership? All the questions that all of astronomy clubs around the country have been asking for 20 years, I think. Does that sound familiar? Like, how do we stay relevant? How do we get more people? How do we diversify? Um, so that's still continuing, a continuing need. Um, oh, I got to be on the Space Junk podcast last month. That was cool. Um, I hadn't listened to them before, and then I started listening to all their podcasts, and I love them. Um, and so it was fun to be, be on that. Um, and then I was asked to help write a 
a chapter in a book on amateur astronomy, engaging the public in astronomy through exploration, outreach, and research. And that book is going to be published sometime in the next month, I think. Um, so we've got to write more books, um, more chapters, do more writing. So um, that's really my story of going from, <laughs> I like astronomy, I'm going to join a club to it's my world, it's my community, it's the community my children grew up in. Now here's my daughter, She's she was taller than when she was first there. The telescope got bigger too. It used to be a 24 inch, now it's a 40 inch. Um, they put a new one in. Uh, but that's, that's um, my story and I would love to chat more about it. And I wanna say thank you for listening to that story and I would love to talk more about it, thank you. Well, Rachel, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. You are a very busy young lady. <laughs> um, if you folks have questions, please unmute yourself and you ask away. Much. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? No. No? I can hear you. Yeah. I can hear you. Oh, you could hear him, Chris? Yeah. Oh, it was just me. Let me stop sharing and see if anything changes. Okay. There you go. Does that change? Yeah, I, I think I can hear. Can you hear me now? Sounds like a commercial. <laughs> Good. Well, I know a moment ago I said thank you very much. I said you are one very busy young lady um, yeah. with all that you do in, in uh, you know, student-based research and outreach. And that's fantastic. I, our, our outreach is uh, pales in comparison, um, but we would like to be better. And you know, with that Middleman telescope that's coming online is something that we're gonna offer to, you know, as an outreach portal. Um, awesome. So. I think uh, we can, you know, offer that uh, the middlemen's asked us to take care of the, you know, the town there we're from, uh, yeah. they're from, and so we'll be we'll be with them. But um, the sky's the limit with this telescope. It's just um, when this thing is up and running at the at the uh, Westford site, it'll be an amazing piece of equipment. You and I talked about that about a month ago. Yeah, yeah, that's and, great. Uh, that's great. Um, I, I I don't know if everybody heard me, but if you unmute yourself, uh, Rachel's going to stick around for a bit and answer questions. Anybody have questions? I do. Yeah. Uh, uh, I am a university professor. And so I often get the question, how the heck do I get a PhD in X? And what I want to ask you is, how the heck did you get a PhD in astronomy education? Because that's hard. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I could I, not tell you where to go. I can tell you how it is so difficult. I'm still working on it. I'm supposed to finish this summer, but I got a six month extension. Um, but it's- but it, What kind soul and what university allowed you to do that? It's Edith Cohen University in Australia, actually. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it's because I knew Michael Fitzgerald who, who ha he got a grant through the Australian government and in there was money for a graduate student. And so he offered it to me. Um, I just, that's one of those amazing things that happens to me sometimes in life where I just can't believe it. And you just got to take the opportunities. <laughs> well, that to me is like winning the lottery. That's one of those rare things that just doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Of course, then there's a lot of work involved, but yes. <laughs> we lost uh Alva, are you still with us i'm still around i think uh, someone else was trying to say something perhaps uh yes that is me i was trying to ask a question and that's why i had my hand raised sometimes it's hard to see hands going up but go ahead okay i was trying up so if she's with us i wanted to and wanted to know know if she said like uh microscopes and telescopes i wanted to know with the agenda if there was an agenda like whether if uh, if it had to uh, do with uh, with like some things that could possibly uh, be possibly being being able to see like to detect uh, out of a microscope that could be like detectable in a, a telescope maybe like or whether if it's like or would any of that stuff be able to detect a corona also too can you hear me yes i could hear you and i don't totally understand the question so 
so the microscope work was in my neuroscience days many years ago. And the telescope work is the research that I do now with students and teachers. And I was, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was, I was just making sure because it seemed like you were kind of like uh, getting cut off. I can hear you at least. Oh, uh, can, can you say something so I can hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Well, you know, Phil, there's a big difference between um, microscopes and telescopes. Of course, they sort of look at the opposite spectrum of things, don't they? Um, um, I used to teach science to middle schoolers and we had a microscope lab and the, the, the other seventh grade teacher would have his kids look at a, a ripped up dollar bill. Um, to see the fine threads in it, which I thought was incredibly boring. So I went and scooped up a glass of, um, I brought in a jar of the muckiest pond water I could find. And I doled it out to the kids. And I said, look, go look in here and see what you find. You know, some of the things were large enough so you could just barely, barely see them with your naked eye. But most of them were, were life forms that, you know, you, we, I had them draw the pictures of the things. I said, look, I don't know what these things are called, so you're going to have to name them yourselves. <laughs> and then we put up a big poster in time for Parents' Night. And the title of the poster, which became the title of the lab forevermore, was never, ever drink pond water. Because <laughs> there's stuff in there you just don't want to drink. So there's that side of the, the world. And then the side that we all, everybody in the club enjoys is looking the other way at, at things that are on the grand scale. Um, and I, 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 I love the fact that, you know, in, in a in schools, you can introduce kids to both sides of that yeah. great spectrum. Um, yeah. I taught, Rachel, I taught chemistry um, for six years at the, towards the end of my career. And hey, nothing beats a good explosion in so a chem good. lab. You know, nothing. Um, my favorite, um, my favorite um, light show was Thermite. We used, oh, to yeah. take, we used to take the AP kids outside yep. and, and ignite Thermite. That is, that is an amazing reaction. Yep. Um, we used to decompose gummy bears, of course, in the lab. And I said, so what do you think if we bought a five pound gummy bear and we bought a lot of, you know, <laughs> chlorate, could we, could we launch this thing from a cannon out in the front yard? The kids used to think that was pretty wild. I said, we really can't because we'll get yelled at, but, but yeah, explosions, fire, good, fire, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it's, a, it, it's a way to get them all kind of interested. I, I think that was one of the biggest frustrations yeah. about teaching middle school, especially middle school, but, but high school was get, getting them, getting my students to be curious about the subject matter we were teaching. That was the hardest thing. Right. So um, yeah, that's one, one of the things that's so amazing about um, this astronomy research is it, it, it too grabs their attention. Mark, did you have a question? No, I, I was just curious how you went from where did the transition happen again from looking like like uh, Rich was saying, you went from inside looking to the macro uh, or the micro out to the macro and you know what, where did the transition happen? How did you get into neuroscience as opposed to jumping right into astronomy? Right. Um, that's actually a really interesting question. And I've thought about it for years, but um, it, it's kind of a silly answer. But um, when I went to college, I tested into honors calculus, but I had never had calculus in high school. I was the only student that had not. And so I really struggled with calculus because it was a little bit above and fast. And then that was needed for physics. And I tried to get help in physics, but the tutor I went to on campus was like, I haven't done this stuff for so long, I don't remember. And I, I actually sort of gave up easily. And my friends said, what classes, what classes in the general education section do you like? And I told them all the classes I liked and they said, that's a biology major. So this is, it's a good question. And it's an interesting lesson that I try to teach people not to do because we really need perseverance. I wish I had had perseverance, although I don't regret having degrees in biology and neuroscience. I think it's added to, you know, what I understand about the world, but 
But one of the things I work with students actually on is, is perseverance. And yes, this might be hard and we've, we've come to an obstacle in our process, but let's work through it. And I wish I had had that growing up actually and, and had persisted and because maybe I would be a professional astronomer, although maybe I, if I was a professional astronomer, I might not be getting quite as much enjoyment out of it. Well, I would have to say that you're probably kind of a professional astronomer at this point, even if it's on, I mean, if you're doing double star research, even if it's with students, you, you know far more about astronomy than, than a lot of people out there, so. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. Um, Sagar? Sa Sagar. Sagar. Um, great talk. I uh, commend you on your efforts and congrats on a varied and amazing path. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One was a simple one that most people might know is, um, what do you get out of the double star astrometry? Uh, is it getting accurate measurements of the masses of the stars or what's the ultimate goal? Yeah, so actually exactly that is, um, you know, once we have the orbits, then masses can be calculated. Um, okay. What's interesting, we're at a, an interesting point in, in what the limits of what I can do, because I said we're limited to um, five arc second separations mm -hmm. of the stars right now, but we're getting into speckle interferometry where we can get 10 times closer. And we can also um, tar start to look at systems with larger magnitude differences. And um, mm -hmm. we're really interested, you know, far fewer masses of the really low mass stars have been studied from orbits. Um, and so it is exactly, you know, the masses of the stars, which of course determine the whole, you know, the properties and life cycles. So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Awesome. And so that leads to my next one real quick, which was, um, what are the other ideas that you have for uh, student research besides the double star astrometry? So that's, that's, that's a fun question. So I myself have participated in one exoplanet research project and exoplanets are really fun, of course. Everyone yeah. loves exoplanets. So after I finish my PhD and finish my postdoctoral work, you know, I'll maybe design courses, although the other people have designed courses for doing exoplanet transits. Um, and I'm sort of on the side involved with some of those. But, um, and I recently did one with actually Michael Fitzgerald, my PhD advisor, he runs a program where people study RR Lyra stars um, and using the same telescopes. Um, they also are a partner of Las Cumbres Observatory Telescope Network. So they study these RR Lyra um, stars that, um, and that's actually a, um, it's a much more challenging project, especially because they're using Python coding to analyze the data and all that. But, it's the scientific value is a little bit higher. And there's always a struggle when working with high school students or undergraduate students of, you know, what is accessible with their maybe limited background knowledge and the scientific value. You want something that has scientific value, but if it's too great, we, you know, we're not gonna have them do black hole research. <laughs> They'll never, right. we just can't do that. Um, so that, that's a really good question. So are our Lyra variable stars, exoplanets, I love spectroscopy, but I've never done it other than a little live video spectroscopy with my telescope, you know, but I've never done a high resolution spectroscopy for, for research. It's a good question. Cool. Thank Thanks. One, one last, if I may, sorry, yeah. everyone. Um, you mentioned, you touched on your uh, research right now in your PhD program about measuring yeah. the impact. Um, yeah. So could you just talk a little bit more? Like, I know, um, obviously if you, see students get into a science uh, major in college or get a science uh, career afterwards, that'd be one way. But um, it's also kind of nice or really great, I think, to um, have students have an appreciation and understanding of science, even if they don't go into the, you know, field. So just wanted to get your thought on that. And thank yeah, you. no, that, I love that. Um, so actually, one of the things that I've done so far is, um, this idea of self-efficacy where this, this sense of, I can learn how to use a telescope. I can analyze an astronomical image. I can learn astronomy. The self-efficacy is a really important part of the learning process, conceptual change. And it's also very specific to tasks. And so I developed a survey 
to measure self-efficacy specific to the use of robotic telescopes and to learning astronomy. And we've piloted that survey on hundreds of students and we've done some before telescope use and after telescope use pre and post test work on this survey. So the first paper that I'm trying to get published um, in my PhD work is actually publishing that survey, which is an instrument to measure self-efficacy to see if students that changes after they've gone through one of these research programs. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and self-efficacy does change. It's just really hard to write a paper for a, a tier one you know, journal. <laughs> there are tons of hands up. Oh, Bruce? I don't know who, um, Bruce, I think you've had your hand up the longest. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for a very encouraging talk. Um, a number of us have been involved in uh, astronomy and other outreach for, for many, many years. Uh, and of course, we use you know, some of the same tools that you do as far as using innate interest in nature and other things in order to encourage kids to get involved uh, in the sciences and then progress in that as well. Um, but one of the things I noticed pretty much all the way along through your talk was really interesting. And that looks like your ability to meet the kids where they are. And I think that's very important. And it's something that, that a lot of our um, more advanced astronomers don't take into account. So even at star parties, for example, um, setting up a, a great telescope and having to have a chair or a ladder that the kids have to get up to. Um, I just wanted to relate a, a quick experience that I had. Um, in 2017, for the solar eclipse, mm -hmm. I was in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh my gosh. Just, we were on vacation, and that's where we were at the time, and we had no idea what was going on. I brought a little bit of equipment, but, but not too much. Um, and so we found at the public library, there was this great gathering and even NASA Goddard was there and they had all kinds of stuff going on. But the one thing I noticed out of all of this was that they weren't meeting the kids where they were. And so I didn't go planning on doing outreach. I went go there planning on just observing and having a good time and hopefully being around other people doing the same thing. But what I ended up doing was, um, although I only had one tripod, which I used for my camera, um, I was able to borrow another tripod and I set up binoculars with solar filters on it. But what I did was I set it up at three feet above the ground. Oh, yeah. And I had a longer line than any of the other telescopes. And the, it was the parents that had to get down if they wanted to look through my binoculars. And it was one of the, the greatest public outreach experiences I've had because it was meeting that need and meeting those kids right where they were. And, yeah. and, and you're doing that not just at public observing, but in the science that you're exposing them to and, and all of these other programs. And I, I really think that's a great thing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I can tell that, yeah, you used the term notice, notice, notice. And so you're, you're sort of doing that same thing, like just paying attention to where people are at. And, yeah. um, and that's really important. That's so key and yet so often forgotten. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, I enjoyed that picture of the four-year-old with the telescope on the ground. Right. That's cool. Right, <laughs> that's right. Cool. right. <laughs> um, Bruce the Lamacchia, have you, uh, All right. you have a question? Uh, uh, so I'm kind of curious if this follows uh, Tiger's last question too about trying to track the effect and this I was pretty involved in Project Astro which was something about 20 years ago yeah. and I worked with uh, fourth and fifth graders and um, in other towns in my local town and I met a senior who said oh I remember in fourth grade and he pretty much I mean I totally forgot it was eight years later um, and that got me thinking like Okay, I mean, you know, Project Astro wasn't, we're not trying to teach people to be astronomers. We just want them 
to as it's a vehicle to teach science and get people curious about the world. Right. But I was always wondering, same question that you said, well, is this really working? I mean, it it seems to make sense, right? But and and you know, that's a great anecdote that okay, eight years later the, the kid remembered making a comment, right? But I, I'm curious, you and you said you were looking kind of pre and post, which sounds like uh you, you talked to him six months later. Has there been any long-term studies? And you know, what have you learned about that? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I actually, um, for the National Science Foundation grant that the Institute for Student Astronomical Research had, part of that was to do a sort of a, a, a ex post facto longitudinal or long-term study. And so I actually interviewed students that had done the research seminar up to 10 years prior um, and of course, there's there's issues with that kind of study and whatnot. But and I I was very um, sort of surprised by the results. I wasn't expecting at, to hear from the people themselves how much it had had an impact on their careers and their life. So of course, you know, I only interviewed about. 15 people, but of those, most of them were able to trace part of their life path back to an ex particular experiences in the astronomy research seminar. So that really struck me as, wow, they, they, it was really impactful for them. Um, the other thing is, you know, and it, it's hard to do these studies on enough numbers. We have so much sort of anecdotal evidence and I always wonder when does anecdotal become data, <laughs> but, um, you know, I've, I've met students many over the years who actually did the astronomy research seminar and then changed their major to astronomy. Now, that's not necessarily the goal, but having a couple of those is, is really impactful. Um, but we're also doing surveys of attitudes towards science and looking if there's changes. And, and part of the rationale is, is just that astronomy is fun using telescopes is cool, especially using the telescopes that the professionals are using, just knowing that you're doing that, does that have an impact? And we're, so we are measuring, and I don't have data yet for like changes in attitudes, but that's something that I am gonna be measuring. Um, and then I think about my own life and how it's been changed by being joining an astronomy club 21 years ago, you know, and I'm not the only one. Um, that's a really, those are great questions though. Like. How, what are the impacts? How do we measure them? <sighs> yeah, and, and, and of course with that, it's like, cause you, there's, you know, you only have so many hours in the day and there's only so many people you can do. It's like, well, which activities are the, the ones that are truly the best? You know, and I, was, I would definitely see different kids have different learning styles and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, this could get really complex really quick. So I, it, it has something that, that I've always wondered and, and you said it and I was like, I've got to ask the question. So, so basically, you're kind of thinking like me, there's a lot of anecdotal stuff, there's small surveys, but at a large scale, we really don't know yet what works the best, it sounds like. Yeah, kind of. I will say though, there's an interesting um, study that I was I helped write the paper on um, a couple of years ago for, out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where they, they have taught a lot of people in local colleges and high schools to use, um, the, they developed curriculum with the telescope, the Skynet network embedded in the curriculum. So the students learn astronomy 101 content and use the telescopes. And over the first, over like a five year period at UNC Chapel Hill, they saw a 300% increase in enrollment in astronomy um, classes and huge increases in astronomy majors and a huge increase in the number of people that took a second astronomy class. And so, I mean, that was, and that was on several, that was on hundreds of students. So um, in fact, they had to build a much bigger astronomy program because of that at the university. So that's the, the best study I know to date that really says, hey, there's something to this. Aside from the fact that, you know, I teach the research seminar three times a year and people are just enthralled and love it. And now they, you know, teachers are teaching it to their students and calling me like I remoted into an astronomy class in Chile or uh, no, in Australia where they're teaching the seminar just to say hi to the kids, you know, and um, I see it spreading. It's in about 15 institutions in the United States now. Um, 
but it is hard to know what parts for what students make the big change. And I know Project Astro and it's hard to know <laughs> where do we do the best work? The big, well, I certainly appreciate what you, you you know, your work looks really good and look into that a little more to see what I can pick out of it. And yeah. I, I appreciate your feedback about what you know. That's not, you know, I'm not going to stop doing it, even if it, you know, wasn't good because it's a lot of fun, yeah. but it is nice to know that it makes a difference, I guess. Yeah, so thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Sure. Rachel, I don't know if you can see the folks that have their, who have their hands up. Kai, Kai has been waiting for a while. Oh, Kai, why don't you go ahead? Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, my, uh, so I'm, I'm, my first question is about along the same line uh, about students' research. I'm just curious, like how long, like say, uh, uh, typical high school students work on this project uh, like uh, uh, several months are you talking about like a, a summer or a summer project or like uh, or more long term uh, what about like uh, say uh, under, uh, college undergraduate students like uh, how long do they stay with the project right so great question so the ones that I teach are tend to be an eight week seminar, but then we often go a couple extra weeks as we review the paper and get the paper reviewed externally and rewrite the paper. So, so it's sort of eight weeks of structure and then finishing up a paper and rewriting and rewriting. Now, the ones um, in Australia doing the RR Lyra, those are designed as 12 week um, seminars. And when I did it, we, we took 12 weeks and then we took another couple weeks to, to rewrite the paper. So, but these we're talking, and for the undergraduates, it's the same high school and undergraduate, but we're talking less than a semester. Um, these are things that can be done with enough structure. And actually um, in some of the interviews that have been done with people who took my course, um, some of the instructors, some of what they said was that having the structure that we have and that we can just give to a teacher is really helpful. It's, it's very clearly laid out. This is week one, week two, week three, et cetera. Um, and teachers need that. I know I was a teacher for 10 years. <laughs> Does thank that you. answer your question, Kai? Yes, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a, a second question that's just minor question. So I'm not sure like, uh, or, and also any uh, uh, club member, uh, anyone knows about the uh, USAAO, like uh, the, uh, the National Astronomy Competition for uh, high schoolers? Um, so uh, I'm mentoring a student uh, who's uh, already uh, passed the first round and attended uh, the NAO. But uh, I guess this is uh, like a, uh, this kind of competition is like a, it's just um, more like a astrophysics and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not for like everyone. It's only for like uh, very motivated students who want to uh, get uh, get to work on this and uh, learn a lot of astronomy and astrophysics and be competitive. But, but I'm not sure like if you have any comment on this. Like, so this is like, uh, I guess uh, I, I only have this experience because uh, this student turned out to be really motivated and he know he knew a lot of astronomy and astrophysics so I guess um, that's like a rare opportunity for me too it's, I mean uh, before I didn't didn't know anyone who had this, this motivated so I couldn't right like I, I recently learned this too actually it's kind of new to me too. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a totally different sort of approach to astronomy than what I do. My students actually, they don't learn a broad sort of spectrum of astronomy stuff. They learn double stars, some Kepler's laws, you know, and astrometry and image processing or analysis, you know, so it's, it's really different. I know what you're talking about, like those astronomy Olympiad things, and that is yeah. some intense stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's see. Let me check. Um, uh, Alva, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, I just have a very practical question. Uh, if I wanted to start a group doing something like this, what kind of equipment requirements are there? Is this a club telescope thing? Is this a small telescope thing? What kind, Do I need a 17 inch? Do I need a five inch? I mean, I'm trying to understand what's really going on here. Right, right, great question. So the telescopes that we use, so um, we use the remotely accessed um, Las Cumbres and those are 0.4 meters. So I think that's 16 inch telescopes. However, I have, worked with a student who used his own um, six inch telescope and actually he took images and then he literally just looked at his images and found double stars, stars that looked like they were close together and then looked up their information in the Gaia data release that was with data release two and, and was able to do some reporting on those stars based on their Gaia information. Um, so smaller telescopes are okay. I think 10 inch and up are probably ideal um, and if you you guys have the knowledge and the experience of how to use the telescopes and the, do the darks and biases and flats and, and all that reduction, um, I've done that a little bit at my observatory years ago, or the, not mine, the one I volunteer at. Um, but, um, it, but working with these students in the, in the, the way that I do in these fast seminars, um, it's nice to just get data that's already reduced. But this is absolutely something that a club could do or students could do with the club, especially you guys have mm -hmm. so much expertise in, in the telescopes themselves. Mm -hmm. so, um, the, the hard part is it's not easy to teach a research seminar. And so I, I am always torn between proselytizing and recruiting versus telling everyone about this amazing thing because what we have found is the best way for teachers to bring it to their students is to go through the program first. And so we have, you know, right now I have 32 students taking my course and it's teachers and students and all combined, but and it's mm -hmm. probably about 20 teachers um, and university instructors in the course. So they take it and then I, I guarantee that I will help them for the first couple of years as they then branch out and teach it on their own. So I'll, um, an example of that, um, a, a teacher from the University of Brigham Young University, Idaho, he took my seminar and then he asked, the first time he taught it to his university students, he asked me to teach the first three lectures. So I did. The second time he asked me to teach the first two lectures. So I did. And now he just teaches it on his own. Um, so that's, um, however, that being said, I'm happy to share materials with everyone and um, mm -hmm. answer questions as my time allows. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see, Mark, is your, is your hand up? Yeah, just, just kind of a comment and maybe semi-question. <laughs> um, with double star research, and I, I do find this kind of stuff fascinating and uh, when Stella came and gave the talk on variable stars, and I know people, there's people in our club who are very interested in this, but I find that when I go out and I do mostly imaging and not, I do some visual, but I'm more of an imager. Mm -hmm. I can't, I, I guess it's my problem, which is I see all of the stuff that's up there and I'm like, well, am I going to just look at a double star tonight? You know, or am I going to look at a variable? I mean, variable stars. You, you, you can't just look at a variable star because right. th the periods aren't that fast. Right, right. Um, but when you, you do, you sell the class that you're teaching, or the that where the students come in. Do you sell it as like, you know, well, you're just going to be looking at double stars. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't say that as a. It's not. You know. It's just. I, I guess it's just because I am, I just find so much stuff that's out there that's so fascinating that it's hard for me to go out one night and say, tonight, I mean, I do it with imaging now because now with I'm doing stacking, so I have to stay on an, yeah. a target for a couple hours or more than a few hours or whatever. So I usually pick one or two, but boy, when I first started doing this, I was like, I got to see everything. <laughs> I want to, I want to see everything that's up there. Yeah, you know, no, it, I'm now it, trying to focus and say, okay, yeah. maybe I could do like look at variable stars. I'm I've been trying to find the supernova, but unfortunately, where my telescope is, I it's still behind the trees until like <laughs> five in the morning or four before, in the morning before before yeah. Cassiopeia gets right. I'm hoping it stays bright enough in the next month or so that Cassiopeia is up above the stars or the uh, trees. Right, right. 
anyway, it was just no, first, it's... Uh, on your comment on uh, I, I, when I did the 2017 uh, solar eclipse, I had a TV monitor hooked up to my camera and I invited everybody to come over and look at it who didn't have solar right. uh, goggles. It was the same kind of thing that you did where I, I could put it low for kids or higher for adults. And I had a line just like you did. It was like, you yeah. know, it gave yeah. people the opportunity. Great, great idea. Anyway, yeah. that was just my yeah. comment. No, that's, those are great, great comments, Mark. Like, yeah, sometimes it, it can be a little bit hard. Although, I don't know, I think I probably sold everyone here on how cool my research programs are, right? You just got to give it the right twist. Um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, we do say, you know, you're going to do a double star astronomy, astrometry project, and you're going to use remote telescopes, and you're going to learn how to write. You're going to write for publication. And we kind of emphasize publishing a paper, because that's totally new for high school students and undergraduates. Um, and a lot of them, in fact, when we surveyed our students a few years ago, I was surprised that the, when asked just open-ended, what's the best thing you got out of the research seminar? The biggest response was, I learned how to write a paper, a scientific paper, which surprised me. I thought it would be like telescopes or something. Um, so, and it's, I, you know, I don't have to sit in a classroom and make everybody do everything. You know, I, I have the freedom to just people who want to do this come and take my course. And so it's easier. Um, but it is, I can see how you would say, well, you're just going to look at that, that, that star there that you can resolve in your little telescope image. Okay. <laughs> We always try to schedule star parties, Rachel, when they're when the moon is in the sky, because that's a that's a that's a pretty impressive object. Yeah. Or planets or whatever. You know, sometimes uh, my <laughs> you know the outreach volunteers complain that well the uh, the parking lot of the school is too bright, and right. we can't see faint fuzzies. I said they, these folks don't want to see faint fuzzies. They just want right. to they want to get you know excited. Yep. Um, yep. I was gonna I I'm gonna put her on the spot, and she knows I'm going to put her on the spot because I've texted her. Um, we have a, one of the participants in the audience is a 13 year old girl from uh, Westfield, Mass, who not only writes her own astronomy newsletter, but um, she has pretty much taken over her dad's 12 inch telescope and she's been showcased on uh, one of the big network TV stations in Boston. Caitlin, come on, un unmute yourself, say hi. Uh, hi. There she hi, is. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> cool. Hello. Wait, so yeah. you write in astronomy, what do you write? I write a astronomy newsletter. It's two pages and it's published once a month. Whoa, where is it published? I feel like I read it recently. Yeah. Where is it published? It's on Facebook. I have a Facebook page. So you might have seen it on. It's called the Starry Scoop. I did see that. And now I get to meet you. How cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, wow. And you, you, take over dad's 12 inch telescope i do yeah awesome and caitlin you started a you've started an astronomy club at school right covid has kind of gotten in the way but that's still something you're working on right um well i switched schools this year so it's been difficult to try to continue it forward but hopefully we can continue it um because covid is hopefully coming to an end soon because of all the vaccines um so I'm still in the process of trying to get it up and running again. Wow, cool. So what, um, how do you decide what to write on every time you write the newsletter? Oh, I, it's, it's very difficult because there's so many things to try to like teach people about and try to like, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we discuss this a lot. Um, I try to do, stuff that's interesting but you can also learn stuff from so it has to be fun and you have to learn from everything awesome. so i do try to like do current events uh -huh. like cop lists and then just anything that's fun and you, re you report what you've been observing and you offer a, an object of the month for people to go out and look at how many how many folks do you send that out to now i mean i know it's on facebook but um, it's difficult to say because I send it out to like school teachers that send it out to their students. Wow. Yeah. Um, so on my on my mailing list, I have about 250 people, but that's an estimate. 
That's amazing. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. So um, do you, people ask me this all the time. I don't know if it's a good or bad question or whatever, but do you have a favorite object? Um, I really like the Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah, okay. That's cool. Wow, it's so nice to meet you. Too. Keep up the amazing work. That's great. See, Kayla, that wasn't hard. <laughs> Wow. I've known I've known Caitlin for a few years now. I met the I met uh, Caitlin and her dad at the the, uh, the astronomers cool. um, conjunction, which is a small convention in uh, the western part of Massachusetts. Okay, nice. Yeah. Alan Slisky, did you have your hand up before? He did, I think. But yeah, yeah there we go. here we go. Uh, a couple of comments. One is um, the Mariah Mitchell Observatory on Nantucket runs a uh, REU program very successfully, they would be a good people to bring into your orbit because they understand how to do this sort of thing. And uh, the other uh, comment I, that popped into my head was I was looking at an online physics course. I, I forget who exactly taught it, but the, uh, the two co-professors uh, said that the course was originally titled Physics for Poets. Oh, Andy Fracknoy. Yep, but as soon as he, as soon as they renamed it Physics for future presidents, the attendance went up 300%. <laughs> so you, you have to have some kind of clever hook, the marketing, you know, uh, astronomy, for astro oh. astronomy for future astronauts. Or there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Any other questions? It's nearly 10 o'clock here on the East Coast. You must be getting hungry, Rachel. You've been, not, you've been with us now for a oh, couple soon. of hours. Yeah, no, well, this has been really fun. Let me do this. Let me, let me switch back to my, well, let me put my screen back up and, and officially close the meeting. Um, like I said at the beginning, you're welcome to stick around. I, I usually stick around until about quarter of 11, um, but some people talk more and more, but um, let, so let me do that. So stick around for a second. Just let me do this. Yeah. See if I can make it work. Uh, let's see, let's share that, share. And I just want to click the slide over. And so just to, um, uh, to remind folks that the next monthly meeting will be on Thursday, May 13th at 20, uh, uh, May 13th, 2021 at eight o'clock PM. Uh, David Levy is our uh, featured speaker uh, next month. And we have an up and coming board meeting on Thursday, June 24th at eight o'clock. I'll let you know when each of those events uh, are to be held and I'll send out the invitations about a week early and you're all invited.